Tired of restless nights? At Lisa, we know good sleep is essential for mental, physical, and emotional health. From memory foam mattresses to hybrids that keep you cool all night long, Lisa's mattresses offer exceptional comfort and support with free delivery and 100 nights to try out your mattress in the comfort of your home. For a limited time, save up to $700 off select mattresses plus two free pillows. Go to lisa.com slash iHeart for an additional $50 off mattresses and select goods. Exclusions apply. See lisa.com for more details. Get in zone, AutoZone. Welcome to AutoZone. What are you working on today? Brakes? We can save you 15% on that. We have OE quality Duralask brake pads and rotors in stock, ready for pickup or delivery. We also have calipers, brake fluid, tools, and anything else you'll need to do the job right. When you get Duralask pads and rotors together, you'll save 15%. It's just part of what makes us America's number one brakes destination. It's time for a big two promote kickoff it? line. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Welcome to Wednesday's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live here on Giants.com, as well as the mobile app. He's Paul Dottino. I'm Lance Meadow with you for the next 60 minutes as we are here to break down a lot that is going to be happening leading up to the NFL Draft. And the program is presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. Multiple ways for you to interact with us here on the program. You give us a ring, 201-939-4513. You could also hit us up on Twitter, hashtag Giants Chat. And as a reminder, you can find the archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcast. So we've got a very busy program. We're going to preview three different programs all located in the state of Florida. And right off the top, let's put the Miami Hurricanes under the microscope. And to do that, we bring in former Miami and NFL center, who you can hear on the Miami Hurricanes radio network as their color analyst, none other than Don Bailey. Let's start with the Miami Hurricanes players, and I want to start at the safety position. They have two players at that spot, but let's focus first on James Williams. I think the one thing that jumps out, Don, about him is his long athletic frame at 6'4", 231. But where do you see his fit on the NFL level? Because he seemed to really make a name for himself more in the box, attacking the run, as opposed to a guy that could flourish in coverage. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I I think he's a Sam linebacker, you know, the strong side linebacker. I don't know that his speed is projected uh, as they thought where he could be at a safety. You know, he's a a legit six-foot five guy. He probably in time can get up into that 230-pound range. And you take the experience that he's had in the secondary, that'll help with with pass coverage, especially if he's matching up on a tight end. And, you know, he's he's a bit of a project in my mind. I I think that, you know, he would have benefited by staying in college another year. But in today's day and age, nobody stays anywhere any long, (laughs) for a very long time anyway. (laughs) So I, I like it. I like him probably as a linebacker to begin with. I think it, when, wherever he goes, he's going to have to participate in special teams early on and, and just continue to, to, to get better, have a better understanding at the, uh, for the linebacker position. Well, with the sub packages that, that a lot of teams play most of the time anyway, or maybe for that matter, a three safety look, that probably will bode well for him and give him a chance to get on the field, don't you think? Yeah, I do, and but I also think he's the size, speed, and the, his ability. You know, coming out of high school and what he's done in college is just too tempting for yeah. a lot of people to to not take. You know, you, there's not six foot five guys that can run like that and still have a ceiling that they haven't reached yet. So I think he's he's going to be he, he he's got a good chance to be a, a very solid NFL player, and he can be. You know, he's your Swiss Army knife. Really, you can put him anywhere you want which is obviously extremely appealing to NFL coaches at the next level because if he's a good fit for whatever scheme they run, they can tap into his varied skill set. So their other safety on the smaller side is Cameron Kinchins. You think? Yes, on the opposite (laughs) end of the spectrum. We're going from a 6'4", 6'5", guy to 5'11". 
But, you know, here's an individual that was very opportunistic, Don, in the last two seasons, 11 interceptions. He also returned two for touchdowns. I don't want to say compare the two of them because obviously their frames are different, but Kitchens, can his opportunistic ways in your mind translate to the National Football League? Yeah, he's a football player. You mm-hmm. know, I think James Williams is still learning learning the game or, or learning to find his spot in the game where Cam is going to come in. He's going to provide leadership. He was a captain here. Uh, the thing that he that impressed me most that, I, that the NFL people, I hope they realize, is that, you know, this was a guy last year that was leading tackler on special teams. He, and he would not, or two years ago, he would not be taken off special teams. He was committed to it. And that tells me you got a guy that'll do whatever it takes to win. Cam Kitchens, uh, again, he was a four six five guy, I think, at the combine, and then knocked it down to the four five seven range here at the local uh, pro day uh, on campus at Miami a couple weeks ago. That helped his cause. I wish he was, you know, was a little bit faster, and I'm sure that the National Football League does too. But at the end of the day, he's got a lot of tape to look at. He started a bunch of games. And he's been productive. And, you know, he has come up with the takeaways. He's turned those into touchdowns. And you know, he's taken over a couple football games. Now, he's still going to have to get, you know, coached up on coverage and understanding his role. But you've got a guy there that will come in and do anything and everything he can to help the team. It's interesting because I'm looking at the comments that, that I wrote down when I looked at some of the tape on him. And I wrote down I liked his physicality, his ball skills, and his motor – I was a little bit questionable with his speed, his reads, and the angles that he took. But but then I also wrote to myself, I'm not sure if he's a free safety, a strong safety, or could maybe even do a little slot work. Do you think I'm off base on that? I like him staying in the safety side. The slot work, to me, he's just going to match up with a you know like a quicker, faster guy a lot of the time. I just think that he's his angles, I agree with you completely. You know, mm-hmm. he had a a tendency to bite on the run a little too much, and, he, and, he, and Miami paid for it. But he's, you have to remember, too, again, a third-year player. That's the thing that I think, you know, people from my era, you know, were, we had fourth- and fifth-year players. Now everybody's in a rush to get out <laughs> in, year, <laughs> in, year, in year three, and, you know, it, it really stunts their development, in my opinion. So, so maybe he needs to find some NIL money and could have stayed another year, <laughs> and, and then he would have been had, then he, he could had, have polished well, up. Both those guys had enough NIL money. I believe, <laughs> Did they? <laughs> huh, it but seems they like, NFL yeah. money. <laughs> and that's where the differential is, which is understandable yes. why they're leaving after their third year. I want to stay, Don, on the defensive side of the ball. Leonard Taylor the third, interior mm-hmm. defensive lineman. He seems to have had a lot of ups and downs throughout the course of his career. The numbers don't necessarily jump off the page, and I think there's some question marks about the fundamentals, especially if you're going to be in those tight spaces on the NFL level. What was your main takeaway about his development during his tenure at Miami? Needed to stay another year. I really believe that. I think you, you you look at the numbers, and there was nothing nothing that told you that he took over a game. I, I can tell you practices, you know, let's go back to the Jim Burt era. Jim Burt used to take over practices and he used to take over games. And in that position, you know, when you're, when you're playing that position, Florida state's got a guy that's probably going to go in the second round. that was a, a defensive tackle and he made a ton of plays. He made everybody else better. Leonard just never was able to get over that hump. He, he would have been better off coming in, as a three-star guy out of high school instead of a five-star guy, and then people would have probably lowered their expectations on him. You know, he's, he's, he, he didn't appear to be in peak condition uh, this year. Unfortunately, he got hurt towards the end. There's potential there, and it's going to be hard to, to uh, not take a guy that, that is his size at that position, and, and he is athletic. You know, he probably doesn't have that top-end speed that you would want him to have, but those guys are impossible to find. I mean, everybody's looking for for that three technique or that zero technique guy that can dominate between the guards. And in time, I believe that could possibly happen for him. But I, I if my advice would have been you need to stick around and, and make sure you're in, in premium shape and you can win some football games single-handedly uh, for Miami from that position. 
had he stayed around, I would suspect he would have been better with his technique because I think he plays a little too high sometimes. And he also mm-hmm. should have improved his strength, which may, which may go back to what you said about the conditioning issue. Because I think, I think if he, as he goes to the NFL, and I wrote this down too, I don't know if he's a 4-3 tackle or a 3-4 defensive end. I'm not sure where he fits best, but he's going to need to pick his game up another notch to play either of those spots. You know, the thing that if you go back and watch the tape, Miami lost a couple defensive ends, and they, they really spent a lot of time in the odd front and, and playing some bear where he was lined up over the center. And that's really where he played his best football. When he didn't, when he wasn't, when he wasn't in the four-three, and he wasn't lined up on a guard, and, they, and he had to look at guys coming from coming at him from the outside or the inside. When he was lined up over the center, and that was his job was to take care of the center. He he really played some darn good football. So, the finding the right home for him, I think, is imperative. He's. In my opinion, defensive linemen are are almost impossible for people not to fall in love with them if they have any type of measurables, and he certainly does. And they're just going to have to understand that the best is yet to come for Leonard. I don't think we've got saw the best of Leonard Taylor at, at the college level. The good news is, you know, he was Jason Taylor was a defensive line coach, Joe, Joe Salave. Uh, played nine years in the league. He was a, as an interior defense lineman, so he's been tutored extremely well, and he should be able to adapt. and I, And physically, he can ho- he'll hold up well enough. It's just going to give him some more experience to be, become a true NFL player. I want to go into your wheelhouse, Don, on the opposite side of the ball. Two offensive linemen. I know the jury is out about whether or not one of them will even be drafted, and that's center Matt Lee. There's also offensive guard Javion Cohen who transferred from Alabama, big man, 6'4", long arms, and Lee seems to be a hustler, a hard worker, even though maybe there's questions about his lack of size at the center position. Where would you assess the upside of those two guys and their fit on the NFL level? Well, when you look at Cohen, in today's world, I'm always looking at eight or nine guys. That's what you need for the offensive line. Sure. So, Cohen was recruited as a tackle at Alabama uh, by Nick Saban, and he, and he played tackle in the Southeastern Conference, and he played started in guard at, in the Southeastern Conference, and then he came to the ACC for a year, and he started to guard there. So he's he's got proven versatility, and he came in and, and played as, at a young age at Alabama, at one of, the, and then he goes to Miami, two great programs, and he's got a lot of tape. He's hustles. He has no issues with grasping the offense. I don't know if he yet has that brute strength that you want from the guard position, but if you're looking for the insurance policy of of a seventh, eighth, or ninth guy, he's absolutely the one. You know, he's not going to give any problems uh, off the field. (laughs) He's a guy that's uh, got a good football IQ. He took coaching extremely well from Alex Mirabal, who's Miami's offensive line coach down here, I think is one of the best in the country. And he bought into that technique. And, and you know, he didn't say, I was at Alabama and this is what we did and, and, and that's what I'm going to do. No, he bought in and, he, and he, he was very coachable. So I think he, there's definitely a home for him in the National Football League. Good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. He is Don Bailey, former NFL center, former Miami center. You can hear him on the Miami Hurricanes radio network. Don, it's always great to catch up with you. We greatly appreciate the time of the inside and look forward to talking to you down the road. Stay well. Nope, that's right. And look, now, if Matt Lee, if you get a chance to draft Matt Lee, I'm telling you, draft him because he'll be your smartest offensive lineman day one. Well, he could very well fit in with the toughness of New York based on what I've seen <laughs> on film, Don. So, who knows? He could be a guy that sneaks onto an NFL roster, and maybe it's here in East Rutherford, New Jersey. But we appreciate the time of the inside again. Thanks so much, Don. Okay, guys. You got it. So, Don Bailey breaking down the Miami Hurricanes prospects, and we've got mainly defensive guys, but a pair of yeah. offensive linemen that clearly he knows well, given he played the position, and two safeties on the opposite end of the spectrum that we talked about with respect to size but James Williams is intriguing Paul because I think and Don hit it when you have the size and length regardless of what they did in college production wise that's attractive to coaches and scouts he's one of those traits players yeah 
I mean, because you can't help but notice those traits and say, well, you know what? Whatever we saw on film or whatever they did with him, I got an idea of how I would use him because he's got some very special tools. Hey, you know what? I don't know which one of those two safeties over the long term will have a more successful NFL career. I can't say that because Williams was the least productive of the two players in school. But because of the traits, he may be more attractive to somebody. We'll see. I think it depends on fit with him. Don yeah. threw out linebacker as a potential position or a pseudo linebacker because he was very strong near the line of scrimmage. The problem is, do you want to expose him to coverage where he struggled? And then with Kitchens, he made up for perhaps the big plays, Paul, that he gave up because he was much more productive in terms of the interceptions. Mm -hmm. For example, Williams only had four picks during the course of his playing days in Miami. Kitchens had 11 so you say, okay, you take the good with the bad from Kitchen's perspective because he'll make up for it by changing field position. With Williams, he wasn't doing that as much, but maybe it's the fact that if you play him in a spot and you say, James, we're going to keep you around the line of scrimmage. We're not asking you to hustle back down the field. He could very well thrive on the NFL See, level. For me, Kitchen's was much more of a, and I, I, I'm going to put this in quotes, football player. You know what I'm saying? The intangibles, the physicality, the kind of get after it, after it sure. you know, get, get your uniform dirty kind of guy. And I'm not, I'm not besmirching Williams in any way, but, you know, maybe it's because Kitchens is also a much smaller frame that he felt he had to play more tough and more physical because he had something to prove. You know how or it is. make up for his limitations. Right. Yeah. You know how it is with some of those guys. Yep. They've got that fire burning just a little hotter, and they, they're a little more feisty and a little more gritty because maybe they were a tad undersized, and they were told, you can't do this, you can't do that. Oh, yeah, let me show you. I, I sense some of that in him. No, I think that's a very fair observation, and that could be the difference as to why you saw more aggressiveness out of him as opposed yeah. to Williams, and it showed up. He's more of a true safety. With the interceptions. Yeah. No. Well, I, that's no debate there. Yeah. See, with Williams, it's more of where are you going to fit him? Projection. I don't think, it's yeah, projection. You're not having that much of a conversation on a similar ground with Kitchens. No. And therefore, teams may say to themselves, well, if we know where we're going to fit Kitchens in, we'd rather take a chance with him as opposed to Williams. It's a little bit more of a guessing It's game. easier to find the room for his peg. Let's yeah. put it that way. Hey guys, it's Ray from the Bobby Bones Show, and it's a great day to venture out in a spacious and capable Toyota SUV like a new RAV4. That's what I'm talking about. Available all-wheel drive. It can go just about anywhere. And with plenty of passenger space and cargo space, you're going to go from morning carpool to weekend road trip without missing a beat. Plus, with available features like wireless charging and a touchscreen interface, your Toyota RAV4 is going to keep you connected no matter where you're going. Or check out a spacious Highlander with seating up to eight. It's a hub for the family adventure. Let's go. You'll drive in comfort and style with available heated and ventilated seats and all the latest tech. And with available hybrid models, your new Highlander can save you tons on gas. Right now, your local Toyota dealer has more vehicles in stock and is making delivery on new vehicles almost every day. Don't wait. Why wait? Buy a RAV4 or Highlander today. Visit buyatoyota.com for deals and more. Toyota, let's go places. So we're going to have Florida State and Florida coming up that we're going to put under the microscope. If you want to try to give us a ring in the meantime, we'll certainly look to squeeze you in as we move forward here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Before, though, we open up the phone lines, one of the things that I did want to throw out, which was NFL news before we even came on, <laughs> we got a trade. It doesn't Big necessarily NFL news. impact the Giants per se, but it impacts the AFC landscape and Brian Dable's former team, as well as Joe Shane, and that is the Buffalo Bills. So they are sending Stephon Diggs to the Houston Texans. The Bills are getting a 2025 second round pick. The Texans are not only getting Stephon Diggs, they're getting a pair of draft picks with Diggs, which is crazy. They're getting a 2024 sixth rounder and a 2025 fifth round pick. So, you know, that jumps off the page because not only are the Bills shipping off Stephon Diggs, but they had to add draft capital to mm -hmm. make it perhaps even more appealing for Houston, which is a real big head-scratcher. And now all of a sudden, and Paul, this is where we get into conversations about how 
It's not the quarterback on an island. It's the talent around the QB. Josh Allen is now losing his top two wide receivers yeah. from last season in Stephon Diggs as well as Gabe Davis, who signed with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, does Buffalo have other talent? 100%. They brought in Curtis Samuel, who's a versatile guy. They drafted Dalton Kincaid, who I think is going to take on an even bigger role. Remember, he's a wide receiver and a tight end body, and we talked about him last year in the draft. So I don't want to say that the Bills don't have weaponry, but you take Diggs and Davis out of the equation, yes, things are going to change around Josh Allen next season. How about the fact that the Bills are now taking on $31 million in dead money this season under their cap? Yeah. Wow. Well, it also goes to show you, it seems like they wanted to part ways with him. You know, I will tell you this, folks. Stephon Diggs is clearly one of your top impact receivers in the league. I don't think anybody would dispute that. But he was a little bit of a malcontent in Minnesota and forced his way out of Minnesota ultimately. And we've even heard some rumblings occasionally out of Buffalo where he was not totally happy with the with the progression of the offense or his role in the offense. Yeah. We had heard some of those rumblings. Well, remember, there was a day where he left during yes. the spring workouts yes. and there was a whole big production. And they that. covered that back up and said, oh, really, it wasn't nothing. There was a misunderstanding and whatever. But, you know, when you see something like this and then consider that Buffalo actually had to throw in some picks too, it, it really makes you wonder how much was that, that discontent or disconnect between him and the Bills. It must have been pretty nasty because why else would you get rid of such a premium player and then take a dead cap hit of $31 million? And this is not your third or fourth wide receiver. This is your number one guy. He's, he's one Allen. of your core franchise players. Yeah. Maybe, and this is once again just my interpretation of the events on top of some of the baggage that you threw out. Maybe they're saying to themselves, you know, Diggs is now 30, Paul. And we always look at that number as a turning point in an NFL player's career. Maybe in Buffalo's mind, they say to themselves, we need to get younger and we think we can get more bang for the buck at a lower number entering 2024. It's possible that that is part of the conversation as well. Remember, listen, I think Diggs is a great player, but you know that big play against Kansas City. Remember, they threw the ball down the field yes. late, and it went right through his hands. Yeah. And that was a huge play. That was the difference between perhaps them knocking on the door of the end zone versus having to settle for a field goal. So that could have been a big part of the conversation, I think, with Diggs in addition to some of the off-the-field issues. I, I will say this. If if you're Buffalo, uh, and remember now, you're building a new stadium, okay? Please, folks, don't ever underestimate the business angle to some of these moves that sometimes get made. I know it's football. I know we're talking about players. But business also plays into it to some degree. Well, I would think, though, Diggs is good for business to get people in the stands Well, from that I, standpoint. I would think so too, but they may be thinking that, like you said a minute ago, at 31 years old, maybe they think he's about to start a decline. And so maybe they think that they're better off getting rid of the contract, getting hit with the penalty this year, okay? And then it's a great wide receivers class. It really is. Maybe they think they're going to get a couple of those really good wide receivers. And then I don't know if their stadium is supposed to be open next year or the following year. Maybe they think that Josh Allen and those guys will be clicking on all cylinders by the time they get their new building. 2026 is when it's There you go. So two yeah. years. Maybe maybe that's part of their thinking too. Maybe they, you know what they say sometimes, right? Get rid of a guy a year too early rather than a year too late. Maybe that's part of it. Well, I'm with you in terms of the draft because that's why I said I could see the Bills having a conversation about let's get younger at the position. But I can still argue you hold on for him, Paul, at least another year, especially given the dead money. That's what's hard to wrap my head How around. How unhappy was he? We don't know that. Well, he must have been furious. <laughs> because right? If you're willing to take a 31 31- million dollar cap it, then he must have been twisting your arm so far backwards that you got to the point where I don't want to deal with this yeah. anymore. Because this is, this to me, this is not a football decision. This has other stuff involved because pure football on the field, who wouldn't want Stefan? No, Davis? you hold on to him. You make that sacrifice for pure football I, reasons. I'm with you.
Yeah, I'm with you. But there's so there's got to be other stuff involved here. There's got to be. But anyway. Well, and now on the flip side, C.J. Stroud gets a proven veteran <laughs> on top of the young guys that are in the mix. <laughs> you, you think he's happy today? I'm sure he is smiling <laughs> ear to ear. And remember, he had an outstanding rookie season, and he didn't have a lot of proven commodities. Man. Now you give him that. I'm sure that he is going to be looking forward to the early stages of spring workouts. All right, we'll open up the phone lines. Then we're going to turn our attention to the Florida Gators. We got Hugo in New Jersey on the line. What's happening, Hugo? Hey, good afternoon, guys. Hey, Lance. So uh, last week we had a debate about the uh, expectations for the offensive line, and I think uh, we uh, kind of agreed to disagree, I guess, is where we ended up. But uh, I did go back. To John Mara's comments, which, which, by the way, your writers, Michael Ice and uh, Dan Salome, have done an excellent job of describing his comments. And a few things in his comments struck me. One, he called the offensive line situation uh, of the recent past ridiculous. He noted the level of investments the Giants have made on the offensive line, starting with the draft pick. So it kind of suggests the John Mara and his own mind things that the Giants have made some relatively outsized level of investments compared to the rest of the NFL. He said, I expect us to be, and this, this is a quote, a hell of a lot better, not slightly better, or modestly better, but a hell of a lot better. And then he defined the expectation, which he said is a good, consistent, productive offensive line like the one we had when we were winning and i think we have the pieces there now now when they were winning call it from 2005 to 2011 the giants offensive line was certainly in the top 10 so maybe i should modify my comments from last week that the expectation should not be top five but at least top 10 for these investments to pay off. So I think John Mayer is more in line with my thinking than sort of where you were. But Well, I mean, once again, I looked at John Mayer as saying that the group has to turn things around if they want to win football games, and I think everyone would agree with that assessment. But what you quoted, nowhere did he say that he expects the Giants' offensive line to be the Detroit Lions' offensive line, and we're going to be talking about them not, in I the mode of I, you know the number one or the elite group. Well, you threw out the Detroit I, Lions, Hugo, last week. That That's where I, the issue I, was. I, I, so I that's where the, I had a problem. I threw out, I, I threw out the, off, uh, the Detroit Lions because... Uh, I said they're the one team I can think of off the top of my well, head. Well, but that that's the standard. Them. But but you picked the standard I to me. I was, I, the I, standard I, of the NFL to me is the Detroit Lions offensive line. Like, that's no, what everyone but, should but I, yearn to have from a consistency and a development standpoint. I, I said they're the top offensive line and that the Giants should be a lot closer to them than the bottom feeder they were last year. Those were those are my quotes. You could go back and listen to, to, to the replay. Lands, but those yeah. are exactly my well, words. But, but once again, you threw out to me the standard of the offensive line. I, I think at this point, if the Giants' offensive line overall, to John Mara's point, could be consistent, can stay healthy, then can produce, I think that that's a huge step in the right direction. I'm not going to put it top one, top three, top five. I mean, you want to categorize it. And remember, offensive line rankings is all in the eye of the beholder based on where you rank individuals. There's no set criteria that says this is the second best offensive line, this is the third best offensive line, because well, how do you by, evaluate that? You can go that? by PFF. You can yeah, go by so PFF that's, but that's grade. one individual's perspective. You go, that's a terrible mistake. You don't want to throw that up, please. Do never, never throw that up as justification for anything. You know better. You well, know better. You, you, you know you, better. You, Come on. Listen, you, 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 you know, know better. It, you know it when you see it. So how would you, I mean, we all. You, you, the I great is simple. Different. The great is simple. Functional. I tell you this all the time. Functional. If the offensive line is functional and your coaching staff, your head coach, and your offensive coordinator don't have to remove chapters out of the playbook, if they can call anything in that playbook, then that tells you that offensive wow. line is functional enough that they can do the job. Once you have to start eliminating chapters and say, look, this guy's not very good. We don't do this very well. All right, let's take out chapter two. Let's take out chapter four. Well, I mean, let's take out. Cha that's when you're in trouble. And that's where the Giants have been for the last few years. Well, right? I, I think 
right? I think that should be. I think that should be the floor that it's functional. I mean, that, John Mara did not use the word functional. He the, said good. The, the once once you are at least functional, okay. Now you're in the middle of the pack, and if you can move on from there, that's beautiful. That's the goal. But where the Giants have been way down here at the moment, you just want to be functional. I don't want Kafka and Dable to have to throw out portions of their playbook. Well, well, That's the yeah. key. Just I, Why I don't you be a little more conservative with your demands and just ask them to be functional this year? And well, then we'll and all I, be happy. Also healthy, you, too. You know, so. you, you know what? <laughs> I, I think that would be fair had the Giants not made – the level of investment they made, which John Mara noted, he expects them to be above them. Well, they got two ones. They got two ones. They got a, a two, two and three. they got and they got well. And, and well, well, right I now the projected starters, the projected starters are two ones, a two, and two free mm. agents who mm. they paid middle of the road money for. Right, and, and they and they also have young players that are supposed to develop. Well, so, so, two well, two well, two young well, players in McKeithen and Azudu who have been hurt. Yeah. and the truth which is, is what I said last week. The truth is, well, yes, yes, I want to believe in their potential. I really do. But right now, you can't count on their potential because they well, haven't gotten on the field enough. All right, you go. Me, let, listen, we, we got a, we got a guest coming up here, so we're going to let you go on that note and appreciate the phone call. We'll get back into the offensive line a little bit later on in the program, but right now let's turn our attention to the Florida Gators who have an appealing wide receiver atop their list, and we bring in Edgar Thompson who covers the Gators for the Orlando Sentinel. Edgar, you got Lance Meadow, Paul Dettino here on Giants.com. Greatly appreciate the time. Hope all is well as everything on your end. Oh, it's fantastic. You're, today I won't be doing this interview from the elliptical machine or wherever we were last <laughs> time. But, uh, yeah, thanks for having me, man. It's our annual uh, little breakdown of the Gators. It's not going to be a long one. There's no, not, not at a all. whole lot of guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, well said. Absolutely, Edgar. And that's why I want to start with the guy atop the list is Ricky Pearsall, their wide receiver, six one, who I thought – was very impressive at the Senior Bowl in terms of his production, and you see what he could do in terms of catching the football and doing damage, but, you know, maybe there's some question marks about lacking the quickness and the speed. Where did you see him thrive the most in terms of how Florida utilized him within the Gators program? The guy is a technician with incredible hands. Mm -hmm. and a lot of grit and that usually implies slow not that athletic i always i always joke around it i talk about pat tilly remember pat tilly sure number 83 for the cardinal that's always my prototype of kind of a slow white possession guy right pat tilly probably didn't even run a four eight but he knew how to get open ricky pierce ran four four one at the combine he had a 42-inch vertical. He had a 10-point, 10 10-foot, 10 6, or 9-inch, excuse me, broad jump. This guy's plenty explosive. It's, an, it's a misnomer that he doesn't have uh, – he's not Tyree Kill, but he can, he can move, and he can explode, and he runs great routes and gets in and out of his cuts tremendously quick quickly and he, he's really a very good player i don't know that there's many people if anyone in this draft has elevated their stock as much as this guy during the, uh, since the season ended you mentioned the hands incredibly reliable hands which every coach and quarterback will love for sure and a great route runner gets the separation my complaint which is why i think he's probably a late second rounder for me is that uh he's going to have to get a little stronger Because in the NFL, there are going to be defensive backs who are going to try to get physical with him and muscle him and give him a real hard time as he's trying to make his catches or even get off the line. Do you think he's got the ability to add a little more meat to his frame and it won't cost him some of those other skills? He got really lean last offseason, like incredibly lean, down to like 8% body fat, which people are like, yeah, that's good. Yeah, go get your body fat count taken. I mean, 8% is like nothing. And I thought he almost got too lean, to your point. Mm-hmm. 
he did 17 reps at 225, which I personally feel for a 190-pound guy is more than enough. That's strong. You used to get plenty of DBs that are doing in the low teens, if even the 10, 12 range. So I think he's got plenty of strength. But, yes, there is a little maybe overly leanness to him. But, you know, man, if he doesn't want to lose speed and doesn't want to lose explosion, right. so it is a fine line. Sure. He's really got great feet, and he works his tail off, and he really works at his craft. So he is going to have to learn how to get re- released from the line and do some of that stuff. There's no doubt and get used to the physicality. I, I was telling someone one day, so many people, are just the, the ignorance they have. I've been doing sports writing a long time, and I was ignorant early. I don't have all the answers still at my advancing, you know, career. But getting off the line of scrimmage in the NFL alone, like the average dude who plays flag football or whatever who's pretty good, they couldn't even get two yards off the line of That's scrimmage right. in like five seconds. Press I mean, coverage is a whole new world. Re- yeah, it's a whole new world. Press <laughs> coverage is nasty. It's real nasty. No, you can't get off the line. So you're making a great point. His release uh, off the line is going to be something he's going to have to work at, but he will is the point right. that I'm making. Right. He'll work at it, and he's got extremely quick feet. And there's a kid here, Eugene Wilson. His dad, Eugene Wilson the second, was a safety for the Patriots for two Super Bowl teams. Uh, Eugene Wilson the third is going to be phenomenal. He's like a Percy Harvin light kind of player. He's that explosive and he's going to be phenomenal. He was the only guy on the team last year who even looked like he had anything close to Ricky Pearsall's feet. So, and his might be even a little better, maybe not as refined, but Ricky's explosive. I think, I think he's going to be fine. I think he's definitely moved himself up into the top 10 ish receiver range. I think Kuiper said he has him between eight and 12 and those are all kind of cookie cutter at that point. It's what you're looking for at that point. So Kuiper thinks he's definitely a second round lock, which is pretty impressive considering he came out of college and a lot of people didn't know if he was even going to be a second day pick. Mm-hmm. Now, Edgar, he was also utilized as a punt returner, and I could see him settle into that role on the NFL level. What jumped out to you about his special teams contributions? And if a team drafts him and let's say they've got – three, four wide receivers, meaning there's a lot of depth on the roster as it stands right now, what he could potentially do in year one as solely a special teamer. He's a fearless guy, man. And that's critical. He's, I mean, he doesn't, he's not afraid to go across the middle. He's not afraid to field a punt, which if you get into like sports in general, I mean, what is more perilous than returning a punt in the NFL? I mean, right. Sure. I mean, you know, MMA or something. I mean, you can get hurt worse than that, but it, literally you're looking, 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 and everything's bearing down on you. He's, he's very good at, you know, that anticipation, catching. He's reliable catching it, and he has a quick first step. I, I don't see this guy, you know, turning into De- Devin Hester or Rick Upchurch back there. <laughs> but the guy, the guy is, you know, capable. But – his future is going to be probably in the slot, wouldn't you think? And, you know, maybe, maybe he maybe move outside too, or he could move outside too. But, I mean, he can work underneath and he can work the seams and do things like that. And I think he could be very, very effective with the right system, right team. Because that, look, in the end, a lot of times it comes down to who you're with. Not everyone can just go to any team and be good. That's a rare player. You got to fit in to the right system with the right people and the right coaching to thrive. So if he gets in the right situation, I think Ricky Pearsall has a long NFL career out of him. I think the only other guy that I, I had heard from Florida that might have a shot at being drafted was Egwukon, the center. Is it Kingsley Egwukon? Is that, am I saying that right? You were butchering it, and I've butchered it for several years now. What should it's, it be? It's Egg Walk-In. Like egg, an egg, egg walking. walking. Oh, egg like walk, egg walking. Almost like Christopher Walken. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is. Yeah. It's like egg, egg walking. So Kingsley is probably a little undersized, pretty tenacious, very experienced, played last year with a high ankle. He suffered sprain, 
midway through camp. It really threw the continuity of the line off. The Gators line was not good last year. Struggled to run the football, struggled to prevent, protect Graham Mertz, who does probably hold the ball a little bit and doesn't have the ability, certainly of Anthony Richardson prior year. But he uh, didn't really get a show last year. That hurt him. And what he did show, he was probably injured a lot of the time. So it's a big uh, – he's probably going to be a late-round guy, and he'll certainly get a shot in the camp. He's confident. At Pro Day, he's talking about – the 10 year NFL career and how he's ready to come take someone's job. It's like, okay, I, I don't know about all that, but he is a bit undersized at six, three, like three Oh five ish, which sounds big, but you know, I mean, these centers are getting pretty big these days and he doesn't have the stature and the base you might think you want, but I don't know. We'll have to see, man. The guy's played a lot of football. He's going to get a shot and we'll see if he can back up, you know, his words because he was very spoke very confidently at pro day beyond that they got nobody and what i would say about that fellas I, i've defended dan mullen's time here at florida in a lot of ways the recruiting certainly lagged there were some things that certainly didn't handle well especially that COVID year some of his statements and things he's an incredible schemer play caller etc but the whole organization he kind of let deteriorate a bit but, man, when you go to Pro Day and there's no one there that Dan Mullen recruited other than Kingsley Walken, then you start seeing what the rot of the program was that Billy Napier walked into. You just There just wasn't a lot of depth of talent here. Well, and I think that's fully documented based on only two players that we brought up in this conversation entering the 2024 draft. He is Edgar Thompson. He covers the Gators for the Orlando Sentinel. So, Edgar, the good news is we'll let you get back on the elliptical for the rest of the afternoon out here. (laughs) I wish I could handle that. All right, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You got it. Our pleasure. Take care. That is Edgar Thompson breaking down the Florida prospect, I should say, in really Ricky Pearsall, <laughs> the wide receiver. And we'll see whether or not Egg Walken has an opportunity at play. the center spot. He oh, can he play. can. Listen, he I can remember play. when John went down to the Senior Bowl and we were having our conversations, yeah. I brought him up multiple times because every time you'd watch practice, he'd make a play. He would do something. And I'm talking about, I know there's questions about speed. That's why I brought it up. But, Paul, he was getting past whoever was on him one-on-ones, and they were throwing it to him, and he was making those catches, whether they were contested or not, in the end zone. So I actually think he's a bit underrated. And I think he could very well be a pleasant surprise in the NFL, depending, of course, to Edgar's point, where he winds up. Yeah. If he is able to develop not only a chemistry with his quarterback, but find a system that is able to get him isolated on guys, he's going to wind up being a target of a lot of key passes in the NFL. I I agree with you. I also like the fact that, let's say he goes to a place, once again, they have an established receiving core, so you use him on special teams for year one. Yeah, you could. And then all of a sudden, you have his role grow on offense. How many times have we seen that? Not a fit, though, for what the Giants need in their wide receiver room, to be honest. Sure. I, I, again, I think they need more of a skyscraper or more of a of a smaller guy who's got unbelievable speed and quicks. Unlike this guy who's more of a precise route runner and more of a hands guy, you know, he brings NFL skills to the table, but I don't think they necessarily fit what the Giants need right now. Well, they also brought in Isaiah McKenzie and they have Gunnar Olszewski. So if you're even looking for once again, my thought process, you have two guys that special the ball, right? So I don't even know if there would be an attractive spot for him from that standpoint. But once again, somebody is going to grab him, and I think somebody will have him make contributions immediately depending on how they could utilize him. So we're going to turn our attention momentarily to Florida State, though. In the meantime, a few reminders here with respect to the upcoming season as well as our programming, the Giants Huddle podcast. You can check that out. Search for the Giants Huddle and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. You could also go to Giants.com slash podcast. As we look ahead to the 2024 season, you could take your fandom to the next level, a season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2024 season. To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. And the Giants official connected TV streaming app, Giants TV, it brings you original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to Big Blue fans. Giants TV, it is free. And in addition to that, 
You can also check it out on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. Lance, just to clarify for, for Hugo a little bit here, because, you know, Hugo, you're better than that. you got to throw the analytics stuff in the fireplace because you know better, okay? You know better than, than, than crazy numerical grades by people who don't know what the plays are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But here, here's what you need to do. Here, the, the naked eye will tell you, like Antrell Roll used to say, believe what you see. And the tape doesn't lie. Yes, an offensive line that's functional. That's that's the base of where you want to be. Okay, like I said, you don't want to throw out stuff out of your playbook. But to get better than that, here's the two things that you look for. When everybody in the building knows you want to run the ball and you can still effectively move the line of scrimmage and run the ball, usually when you're in your four-minute offense, Okay, or you're in a grinded out kind of game that you're trying to control field position. Okay, same thing with the pass. When everybody in the building knows you have to throw it and you're still able to send your quarterback back into the pocket and your offensive line gives him the time to look downfield, go through his progressions and make any throw he wants to throw. Those are the two things that you look for that are above functional. Once you get to functional, that's that's the standard. Anybody above that is functional. How do you now grade above functional? Well, it's that. When you need to run it, can you move the line of scrimmage and run it? When you need to throw it, can you give your quarterback enough protection that he can pick out the guy he wants to throw it to? That he's not having to get rid of the ball with with a quick strike and he's not playing quick game because I got no time to look at my second and third receivers. I got to go to my first guy on the quick slant or the, the wide receiver screen because I haven't got a chance in hell of holding up if I hold that ball for more than two seconds. Those are the things you can see that. If you honestly need some analytics person to give you a numerical grade for that stuff, then you better watch a different sport because that's stuff that anybody who knows anything about football can figure out just by watching it themselves. That's how you take functional to the next level. Hey guys, Mario Lopez here, and I have to say it's a great day to venture out in a spacious and capable Toyota SUV like a new RAV4 with available all-wheel drive and go basically anywhere. And with tons of passenger and cargo space, you'll go from morning carpool to weekend road trip without missing a beat. Plus, with available features like wireless charging, your Toyota RAV4 will keep you connected wherever you land. Or check out a spacious Highlander. With seating for up to eight and plenty of tech, it's a hub for family adventure. You'll drive in comfort and style with available heated and ventilated seats and all the latest tech. And with available hybrid models, your new Highlander can save you tons on gas. Right now, your local Toyota dealer has tons of vehicles in stock and is making deliveries on new vehicles almost every day. So don't wait. Buy a RAV4 or Highlander today. Visit buyatoyota.com for deals and more. Toyota, let's go places. I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure no, we got that's fine. I mean, I did want to expand on that as well. But right now we have a guest on the line. So let's turn our attention to Florida State and then we'll expand on your last point with respect to the state of the offensive line to help us break down the Seminoles class. And it is big and it is large. And that is none other than Brendan Sinone, who works for Knowles 24-7 through 247sports.com. Brendan, you got Lance Meadow, Paul Dottino here on Giants.com. Greatly appreciate the time. Hope Paul as well as everything on your end. Vince, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm doing well. I, I will make sure to not bring up any analytics during this conversation. <laughs> yes, because my partner seems to be a very big fan of it. I see that you picked up on that. Oh, so. I, I have a hunch you're, you're a much smarter man than that anyway, aren't you? <laughs> hey, you, you know what I go by in life is balance in all things. And there's uh, some people who lean really heavily on the numbers for everything, and that's probably not the way to do it. And there's some people who just go, I test, I test, I test. Uh, and those numbers can maybe teach us some things. So that's that's my methodology. That's how I try to balance it a little bit. But um, but yeah, I love. Uh, I, I think tape trumps everything too. What you see really, really matters. There you go. You're a good man. 
Well, and that's why we're curious to get your perspective, Brendan, on what you saw out of this Seminoles class. And let's start with their top guy, and that's edge rusher Jared Verse, who clearly made a name for himself in each of the last two seasons after he transferred from Albany. I think his story is interesting. I don't know if a lot of people realize he started off as a tight end, then transitioned to defensive end, and we see what he did over the last two seasons. Nine sacks in each of those campaigns. Where would you assess... From what you've seen in his development, where he could potentially take his game to perhaps another level on the NFL stage. This is what's so cool about Jared Verse. He just keeps getting better. And you mentioned he's made a name for himself, and he is super self-made. Like he has gone from a no-ranked recruit that was you know, kind of undersized, really undersized, out of a small area in high school, small rural area, high school in uh, in Pennsylvania. And, goes to Albany and during the pandemic back at home and uh, gets a weight set and just keeps, you know, lifting weights and getting a lot of protein and gets bigger and stronger and faster. And then FSU's scouting for Syracuse uh, back in 2021. And they see this dude chasing, um, I'm blanking on the name of the running back now. He's a pretty good running back for them. Was Sean Tucker maybe um, for, for Syracuse. And they see his defensive end uh, tracking him down go downfield and they're like oh if that guy ever enters the transfer portal we should take a look at him and it was jared verse and um you know he came to florida state as like a freaky athlete like some of the like he was able to run down jordan travis quarterback jordan travis pretty regularly and jordan's fast quarterback and um you know jared made life difficult for him in practice and this past year he just got a lot bigger a lot stronger had to kind of learn how to play with a little bit of extra weight and that's where you see a lot of the production for him the pass rush production got better as the season went on and was frankly really dominant by the end of the year against Florida and Louisville when they really needed to have it. He brought it and learned how to play with that functional weight. So as we think about like where he, he goes next, like I think he's someone who's he's learned how to play the run better uh, over the years. He's learned how to play with more weight, which will help him in the NFL. You know, he, his testing numbers were really impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's really smart. And I think that's where like, he, okay, you he think he's going to keep getting better. He works really hard. He talked to him super thoughtful, very, very intelligent, intellectual, charismatic as well. Got a lot of personality, um, not afraid to, to talk a little trash or a lot of trash, as teammates can probably tell you. So, like, there's there's a lot of juice there. I understand why he's a first-round prospect. And, um, you know, is he super bendy? Like, like Brian Burns is someone for Florida, Florida State you guys are familiar with, like, has a lot of bend. And mm-hmm. um, this is a different – this is more of a power-based edge rusher. Yeah. And that's where Jared Verse is going to make his, his money in the NFL. But, like, you can find a lot of ways to use that, I'm sure. Well, I think the fact that he started at Albany and then went to Florida State, I, I wonder, from your perspective, developmentally-wise, had he been at Florida State the whole time, would he have had more development? Would he be more polished right now? Would he be even thought of in a bigger light had he started out at the higher program instead of starting at Albany? Or did the start at Albany – make him into a self-made prospect, as you just said, and do you think that was to his advantage? Yeah, it's interesting because that's exactly where I was going to go with it. Like physically, he might be, he might have been a year ahead of where he is now if he went to Florida State and just mm-hmm. had all the, as I'm knock on Albany, like go ahead and look at some of their, like they're, they're sending guys up to Power 5 level every single year now. Sure. They're going to have other guys who are like UDFAs. Like they do a really nice job at that level, but it's, just, it's not the same when you talk about resources. You have to strength conditioning program, all that stuff. Not the same. And Jared Versus said that, too, like that Florida State helped him in that regard tremendously. Um, but the idea of how having to kind of climb from the bottom and, and rise through the ranks, it just fits super well in who Jared Verse is. And you don't know how something like that can change someone if you went a different path. So I think it served him really well. And just, again, if you get to hear him speak and, and talk to him, like you kind of understand like that, that proverbial chip on his shoulder is a real thing. He doesn't probably have that if he you know, is – he doesn't have a growth spurt early on in college and doesn't have to go you know, home during quarantine and, and lift a bunch of weights and figure that out himself. But but it did happen, and, and here we are talking about him as you know, probably top, top 15 pick. I want to jump to the cornerback position. I'm going to group two guys together. I know they're not necessarily going to be drafted in the same category, but you have Renardo Green, and then you have Jerry and Jones. Green stood out, Brendan, for how he defended the LSU receiving core. And there may be a guy that the Giants draft at number six by the name of Elite Neighbors 
who Green really made a name for himself to continue that theme as we were talking about with respect to Verse. And then Jones, I guess my bigger question is, where do you see his fit? Is he an outside guy? Is he a slot guy? Because he doesn't necessarily have the best overall speed to keep up with guys specifically on the exterior of the football field, it seems. Well, so with Jari and Jones, it is interesting because he was, his story arc is interesting as well. He's a Mississippi kid, went to Mississippi State, transferred out of there, almost went to Ole Miss, ended up coming to Florida State, and was not very good his first year, frankly. And part of that was he was not, he was not healthy. Um, he played through that and was one of the worst graded cornerbacks in, in college football. Uh, and they stuck through with him, and, and he dealt, dealt with injuries like in off seasons, both like before 2022 and then before 2021 as well. And he's just never really healthy. And midway through 2022 season, he was playing outside corner, kind of figured it out, started making plays, and ended up doing really well that season. They decided to move him into the slot this year, and um, he was just really mature and and showed that maturity. And they also played him a lot on special teams, and he was willing to do everything. And he's got good length; he is about six one or so. A good good length for a slot corner. He ran a four three eight forty yard dash, I think, at the combine or around there, and that surprised me. He had good speed, but not I didn't think elite deep speed, but apparently <laughs> apparently it's there. Um I think he has the, the ball skills to even play safety. So like you know, I, I think an NFL team with creativity, uh with with aptitude for versatility, uh would find some value in, in Jari and Jones. And again, there's a maturity level that he he, he matured in his time at Florida State and, and kind of grew into a, a really thoughtful young man, and, and that was cool to see. Uh, Renardo Green's just a dude. Like, he is, <laughs> he is not the flashiest cornerback. Um, you know, I think even, like, his 40 time was just a shade under 4-5, and they didn't have a ton of interceptions. And, again, yeah, there's other corners who are going to put more robust numbers and maybe look the part a little bit more than him, but he's so technically sound. He is insanely gritty like he just he he relishes contact he loves that part of the game uh press coverage his numbers and man coverage are really good uh and just he was always up for like you mentioned the league neighbors he was always up for a challenge and tough assignment one that's like kryptonite's kind of weird it's just fade routes in the end zone he has a hard time with and if that didn't exist like i, I wouldn't know really what the flaw is in this in this game but like i'm I'm really high on Renardo Green. I, I follow the draft, nerd out with that stuff pretty closely. And there's a lot of people who have him as like a second round pick, which going into the season, I think that would be quite the case because I know what the athletic like upside was. But uh, the film was really good. The numbers backed it up. Um, he tested well enough. Like he, he's a lot of fun because he's just he's so solid at everything. And again, that that physical mindset is something you really can't coach. He, he's a lot of fun. Well, it is a deep draft in corners, and I do expect those guys to certainly get some interest. I'm a big fan of Braden Fisk, uh, the defensive mm-hmm. tackle, who, yeah, you know what? He's going to have to add strength in the NFL, but who doesn't, especially if you're playing in the trenches? Uh, his technique, got to polish that up, but again, who doesn't have to do that? Plays a little bit high because obviously he's got a big frame, but he does so many things well. He's a gamer to me. I, I there's a guy, okay, I just I'm really going to be keeping an eye on him when he gets into an NFL training camp. I think he could be a really good three technique in, in the NFL. How do you see it? Yeah, I think three tech is probably where you want to play him. And he's got some – it's fun. If you go back and even look at some of his film when he was at Western Michigan, they would put him you know, on the edge sometimes as well, and they would kind of go with three-man fronts, and he'd wreak some havoc there too. And they do that in earlier downs too. And, uh, and and I want to say wreak havoc. It was against like power five teams, like I think Pittsburgh and Michigan State. Um, like so, and those were some of the things that made him a coveted recruit when he entered the transfer portal. And that's another self-made guy. Like he was not a highly ranked recruit out of uh, I think it was, was it Michigan City, Indiana, or Indiana City, Michigan. I can't remember. <laughs> but <laughs> he's from up somewhere where it was really cold. FSU's coaches had to go up there and recruit him, and then the freezing cold in the winter. You were right. It's Michigan uh, City, Indiana. I just looked Michigan it up. Michigan City, Indiana. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it was by, I think it was by one of the lakes, too. Like, I just remember the FSU coaches were like, what do we do? It? Like, this is crazy to be going up here in December. But it paid out. I mean, it paid off for them. It worked out pretty well. Um, and, and he was a really, like, just, again, another undersized high school recruit who just grew up in college and yeah. had those kind of guys sleep through the crack you see him now did he bulky. grow <laughs> um, yeah it's just, that's a bit of an understatement but man, i love the way he moves his athleticism it tested that way too like yeah he ran at the four seven but you guys might find this fun like he used to race mike norvell 
FSU's uh, head coach every before every practice. They would run 100 yard sprints. And you know, Mike Norvell is a former college wide receiver. He's 40 years old. Like he's in decent shape at 40 years old. I'm great shape for 40 years old. I wish I could run 100 yards. Um, and they would sprint. And Fisk would beat him at 300 pounds plus. Oh, you know, 100 man. yards for, for a big dude. Um, what I liked about Braden is he came to FSU. He knew he had one season. He had to make it count. He battled some injuries through the year. And he's another guy who just got better as the season went on. Like, go ahead and watch him against Louisville. It was inspiring the way he played. You know, put him in multiple positions on the defensive line. Like, he just, he's someone who, who embraced, like, what FSU was doing culturally. Um, he, he found a way to harness his athleticism and to make it work for him. And get he, I mean, he's, he was playing with, like, you know, before the last two games of the season, he's walking with a walking boot. When he's getting to the field, because he had turf toe. And it didn't matter. He still figured out a way to get it done. Uh, he is. He's been a fast riser, I think, through the senior bowl and the draft, or the the combine process has probably put him in, you know, being a, a second round guy. You know, maybe maybe if there's bad medicals, round three, but like you know, someone, someone's going to fall in love with him and, and probably take him pretty pretty early because of all the fun traits he has and the intangibles. Mm-hmm. I want to flip the script to the offensive side of the ball. They have two wide receivers, Brendan, Florida State, and two that my partner likes because they're towers. And Keon Coleman, 6'3", and then Johnny Wilson, 6'6". There's even talk that maybe Johnny Wilson can entertain tight end in the NFL. But, you know, the million-dollar question is, okay, you're tall, but can you then use that height to your advantage? So that's my big question with both of these individuals. We talk about catch radius. We talk about size. Did they maximize, in your mind, the frame, or do the way that they play, it doesn't necessarily equate to the intangibles that they showcase? So, Johnny Wilson, I'll start with him. Like, yes, like he is six foot seven legitimately, and the wingspan is his, you know, unprecedented. It's freaky, um, 99th percentile type of stuff, hand size as well. And he, he's really bendy at that, at that size. The, the speed is pretty good at that size, too. You mentioned catch radius. Like, it's, it's there. The one thing with Johnny at times is that the concentration drops. Yeah. That's been an issue with mm-hmm. him throughout his career. And uh, I will say that was an issue early on this past season. He cleaned that up a pretty good deal uh, as the year went on, if you're looking for, like, a positive trait to figure out. But, but also that also hurt him at earlier points in his career as well. So it's not something I would dismiss as a one-off earlier in the season. This happened in you know, one or two bad games. Um, but, but like, the, the tools, like, the, the ability to go and get the ball and just be – I can't tell you how many times in practice, like, he'd be covered. It did not matter. Um, he, he would find a way to go get it. And, again, the, the athleticism goes within that size – you can't, you can't teach that. Like mm-hmm. it's, it, it is what it is. So, um, yeah, it's like he's a guy who is super intriguing. And yeah, is he a tight end? Is he an outside wide receiver? Um, I will say he blocks really hard on the perimeter. So that is, if you are thinking about making him like a flex tight end or whatever, um, that is a point in his favor is that he will try out there. Like he will care about that. Keon Coleman to me is is polarizing because you see what his A game is. Like go ahead and watch LSU. He dominated that game. And that was LSU's secondary before. It was just ravaged with injuries. Uh, and there's other freaky moments where they put him at punt returner and six foot four, 220 pounds moving like that as a returner. Like, okay, that, that's different. Uh, the, the testing wasn't great for him. He ran a 4 6 40 yard dash, but, you know, GPS testing says otherwise. He can, he can move during games. And the eyes, again, back to that point, I test tells you he can move when he gets into the open field. He did battle with injury that was not disclosed for. About half the season, I think that really, really kind of hindered some of his explosiveness, forced him to kind of just be a, a contested catch guy. And, and he, he frankly, his contested catch numbers were much better at Michigan State than they were at Florida State. They tried to kind of force feed him in traffic. It just became a really inefficient play for Florida State and for Keon Coleman. Um, yeah, I know some of the, the the numbers lovers like to say like, oh, well, there's not a lot of positive success rate routes for him. And, and, but then you watch when it's good, and it is really good. So, like, I don't know how to quantify Keon Coleman and how to grasp it. Like, yeah, the, there'd be games where he'd go away for a while, and there'd be games that he just would absolutely take over. He's young, right? He's had two solid seasons in Power 5 level, uh, and he's had some dominant moments. So, like, you know, someone's probably going to take care you know, roll the dice with him in a strong wide receiver draft in, on, in day two, and I wouldn't fault him for it. I just, I'm just not sure entirely, like, 
where where he would go early round two, late round three. I don't know. Well, I I think he he'll probably go second. I, I will say this: I did have a little bit of trouble with with his willingness to block for the run game. Now, is that because yeah. is that because of some of the injuries? He didn't want to mix it up some, because you know when you get to the NFL, those wide receiver coaches, a lot of them are going to say, "Man, you got to block, you got to help out on the edge, because you can break a big run for your running back if you'll just do that." And some guys just don't want to get involved in that. And I think earlier in the year, if I remember, like LSU game, like that was there. Uh, I remember a game against Boston College, which was your third or fourth game of the season. There was some pretty bad moments in blocking. One that was pretty costly that I think mm-hmm. cost FSU a uh, they did like a little screen pass to running back and mm-hmm. if you block it uh, it might be out the gates instead right. the, the, I think it was Elijah Jones skips slips right by him and forced fumble and all of a sudden it became a game um, but I don't think he was hurt then I think that might have been a flu game for the entire team of the defense especially I think a lot of guys were sick um, but you know as the year went on yeah some of the physicality waned um, I would love to to kind of go back to all twenty two and focus on the blocking late in the season and see if that was any different. But yeah, I think he became slightly less physical. And honestly, too, like uh, this is an ideal when Jordan Travis got hurt at the end of the season, I feel like we didn't see the same version of Keon Coleman. I don't know if he pressed. I don't know if he got disinterested. Yeah. I really don't know what happened, but I feel like when those final few games, he, he might've been trying to do too much at times and started getting frustrated then with some of the younger quarterbacks. And just, it was, it was not the same threat that, that it was, earlier on in the season, unfortunately, for Florida State. And offense kind of bogged down, you know, consequently. And it's understandable considering they then utilized two other quarterbacks as they went into their bowl game. So that's obviously going to impact the talent around them. Well, Brendan, we'll leave it. Do you want it? Throw well, we're, we're, we're over time. Yeah. But, Brendan, I'm going to add, I know we're over time. I need 45 yeah. seconds on Jordan Travis. I know he got hurt. But if you're looking for a developmental quarterback on day three that you can stash for a year or two, how, how about some real quick 30, 35 second thumbnail on him? Maturity is there. I want to talk about self made. He was someone who was considering quitting football, you know, three, four years ago. Uh, he had he had an awful toxic situation under Bobby Petrino in Louisville, quarterback coach at a uh, at Florida State. Believed in him when he kind of came here. The head coach didn't. Uh, previously, Willie Taggart. He didn't think he was going to get it done. Uh, Mike Ravel's staff worked with him really, really well. Jordan's footwork got better. His maturity, his ability to read defenses was excellent this past year. Mm-hmm. When he's good, his athleticism is really, really good. You just got to see how he responds from leg injury. But there's a lot of intangibles to like with him, for sure. You know you're going to get like a, like a high-class personality in the locker room at, at a minimum there. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. We greatly appreciate the time and the insight. He's Brendan Sinone, Knowles 24-7 through 247sports.com. And Brendan, look forward to having you on down the road to continue to preview the prospects out of Florida State. Thanks for hopping on. Thanks, guys. You got it. Our pleasure. As that is a deep roster that is going to produce yeah. heavy-duty NFL talent. We could have even thrown out a few other players that probably are going to go on day three in the NFL draft. But we'll at least leave it at that for the time being, as we'll be back up and running again on Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern, continuing to preview the upcoming NFL Draft. We appreciate everybody for tuning in. Today's episode, Big Blue Kickoff Live, part of the Giants platforms everywhere, and Giants.com slash podcast. For Paul Dottino, I'm Lance Meadow. Stay locked to Giants.com for all the latest, and we'll speak to you on Thursday right here on BBKL. Have a good one. Hi, I'm Gabby Reese. Join me and my husband, big wave surfer, Laird Hamilton, on our journey with Laird Superfood. From our kitchen to yours, we've crafted delicious plant-based creamers, coffee, greens, and so much more using high-quality functional ingredients. Visit LairdSuperfood.com and use the code GABBY2024 for 20% off your first order. Introducing the Lisa Chill Collection, your answer to hot nights. These mattresses beat the heat with ultra-cool covers, whisking away heat for the perfect sleep temperature. Save up to $460 on chill mattresses and get two free pillows when you shop now. iHeart listeners can save an extra $50 off by visiting lisa.com forward slash iHeart. That's l-e-e-s-a dot com slash iHeart. Exclusions apply. See lisa.com for more details.